Ah, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me and see me? Good. Yep. Yep. So, so yeah, my name's uh, Richard Doan. I'm the Coast and the Wash Assistant Warden for Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust. And I'm here this evening to talk to you about marsh harriers. So I guess the first question uh, is what is a marsh harrier? So the marsh harrier is um, the biggest harrier in its family. So there are three marsh harrier species, uh, sorry, three harrier species here in the UK, including the marsh harrier, the hen harrier and the Montague's harrier. So as you can see on the top left picture, uh, this is the male marsh harrier. So quite distinctive species with a gray, uh, gray wings with the black wingtips uh, and a bit of a brown back, a little bit different to the male hen harrier, which is all gray on the upper wings. And then we have on the opposite side, on the top right hand side, this is the adult female marsh harrier. So you notice the very chocolatey brown wings and tail. And one feature of a female marsh harrier is the, the golden parts of the upper wings. Uh, alongside the cream cord head as well. And then uh, when we look at then the immatures or the juvenile species of marsh harrier, uh, they're very similar to the female marsh harrier, but typically tend to be quite dark, the very dark chocolatey brown, sort of lacking the gold on the upper wings of the adult female and having a very distinctive sort of cream crowned head. So the, the phrase cream crowned uh, kind of refers to juvenile marsh harriers as well as the females, because basically the males take a two to three years to develop that lovely gray upper wing and underwings. So that, that phrase cream crowned just means female or immature type marsh harrier. Uh, for the keen eyed people in, on, the, on the call here, you might notice there are actually three species of bird of prey on this slide. So in the middle here, we have the hen harrier. So just to, just to give you an idea of some species you can might get confused with. So with hen harrier, uh, so you might have heard the phrase ring tail. The ring tail refers to this really lovely white band around the base of the tail. Uh, this is a, a feature of both male and female hen harriers. And hen harriers tend to be much narrower winged, much more delicate and flamboyant of the two species. With marsh harriers, quite a broad, quite a broad winged, powerful harrier in comparison. And also you have the common buzzard on the bottom left. So common buzzard um, tends to be more dif in different sort of habitats. So around farmland, roadside verges, that kind of thing. And a couple of features to look out for here. So with buzzard, they're typically very white underwings and very dark uh, upper wings. When you compare that to the female and immature marsh harriers. So females tend to be quite dark underneath and the immature marsh harriers, so quite different. And also in sort of wing shape. So marsh harriers do tend to raise their wings in a bit of a V shape in flight, where the buzzard's quite flat winged in comparison. So hopefully this video will play. So this is just a video showing um, the courtship display of the marsh harrier. So basically the female's the one that incubates the nest about 95% of the time. And the male will be sort of back and forth with food. So every sort of few hours, depending on how far it's got to range. So here we have the female, so just off the nest. So it's meeting the male who's coming in with some food. And you'll see the male marsh area passing the food to the female and quite a spectacular sort of food pass. A bit of a slow motion video here. This is showing in a bit more detail. So quite impressive. You can also notice occasionally that they don't catch the prey. So in the UK, marsh harries do tend to favour the reed bed habitats. Uh, particularly uh, in the UK, uh, as opposed to in Europe, where they tend to favour sort of farmland habitat. Uh, this map just goes to show sort of the, the um, migration routes of the marsh harriers. So in the past, a lot of marsh harriers would migrate to the UK, to the west coast of Africa. But we are finding in recent years with climate change and that kind of thing, lots more marsh harriers are actually staying in the UK every year. So all year round in the winter, which is quite a recent thing. 
So there's some quite spectacular roosts, especially in the Norfolk Broads. They get up to 100 wintering birds in one place, which is quite spectacular. We also know about these migration routes just uh, through the colour ringing scheme. So on the bottom right here, this is a marsh harry from Kent. You see the, the colour tags on the upper wings here. So that helps identify sort of unique individuals. So we can sort of track their movements on migration. So the map itself uh, shows that um, this is a marsh harrier that was ringed in North Norfolk in 2018 and then recorded the year, uh, following year in Senegal. So a distance of about three and a half thousand kilometers is traveled. Although I do find it's a bit deceptive sometimes with a straight line. So I tend to find with most bird species uh, do tend to actually follow the land as opposed to doing quite long sea crossings. Most birds don't like to travel over the sea because they're quite vulnerable then to wind and weather and that kind of thing. So, for example, most marsh harries, I would probably think, uh, would probably migrate to Kent and then cross via the shorter sea crossing into Europe and then follow follow the coast from France through the centre of Spain. Oop, where are we? Here. Yeah. Uh, through France, uh, along the uh, west coast of, of France, then straight through the centre of Spain, uh, across the Straits of Spain, Gibraltar, rather, uh, into Morocco, and then following the west coast all the way to Senegal. And this, just, this map just um, illustrates the distribution of marsh harries here in the UK. So the green indicates uh, where marsh harries are all year round. Uh, the blue shows the wintering areas for marsh harries. And then the yellow indicates the, the breeding sites. So with the green, that will in also indicate the breeding areas and the wintering areas as they're all year round. This is a recent map produced by the RSPB. And of course, although marsh harries are quite common now, it wasn't always the case. So it's a bit of a history of marsh harries here. So in the 1500s, they were thought to be the commonest bird of prey here in the UK. And also at this time, when the fens were in their prime, there was huge numbers of, of other species, such as like little bitterns used to breed here in the UK, uh, black terns. There's even evidence to suggest that Dalmatian pelicans also used to breed in the UK, that kind of thing. And then as we come into the 1800s, the population started to reach quite perilous levels. And then by the 1900s, there were less than five breeding pairs in the UK. So mostly from the East Anglia region of Norfolk, this sort of area here. And then in 1971, obviously on the brink of extinction, with just a single breeding pair that was in Suffolk at the RSPB reserve at Minsmere. So you might be thinking, what, what caused this decline since the 1500s from being the commonest bird of prey to now being on the verge of extinction? So there are a number of reasons for this decline. So number one uh, would be the Fenland drainage. Although not one factor in particular is the reason for the decline, more the, the factor of all, of all four factors, or numerous factors affecting the population. So the Fenland drainage, which did, did start in the 1400s, uh, on a small scale, and then up until the 1800s, 1900s, as, as machinery got more advanced, did become much more major in their operations, much more extensive on the fens. Uh, also in the Victorian eras and beforehand, uh, the, the egg collecting was quite a big thing. So quite a few of my friends, also bird watchers, so all kind of re retirement age now, uh, they actually got into bird watching through egg collecting as young kids. Something they kind of look back on now, is not a good thing, of course. Um, also DDT, so this is the insecticide used quite commonly. So it was developed and used quite well into the late 1800s in America. And also here in the UK from the 1900s, it was used quite commonly. And what DDT does, it, obviously it's an insecticide, so it does kind of affect the prey at the bottom end of the scale. So that this, this basically, uh, all this builds up in, in DDT in its prey, marsh harries, uh, kind of resulted a bit in there. So not producing young so well. So for example, the, the eggs were much more thinner, the membranes much thinner of the eggs, and therefore the eggs were sometimes infertile, so never, never hatched, that kind of thing. Uh, also shooting. So before legislation came in, there's no laws to protect marsh harries. So they were shot quite a bit in the early days. But you also think from like a, a gamekeeper or a, land, a landowner point of view, if they see a big bird of prey going towards their livestock, they might get a bit worried. 
So what's been done nationally uh, since since the 1970s? So the first thing was the, the Ramsar Convention. So this started also happens to coincide with the, the year there was just one Marsh Harrier in the UK, so 1971. So the first Ramsar meeting was in Iran, 1971. This was basically to decide the future of the wetlands throughout the UK and the world, so worldwide. We also had things like the SPA and SAC. So SPA is Special Protection Areas here in the UK, and SAC is Special Areas of Conservation. These sort of took off in the sort of the late 90s or 1900s, so 1980s, 1990s. And then we also have the Wildlife and Countryside Act, 1981. So the SAC and the SPAs protected their habitats as well as the Ramsar uh, designations. But the Wildlife and Countryside Act uh, also protected the species itself. So under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, Marsh Harrier is a Schedule One breeding species. So this basically means it's protected and on, at or near the nest uh, by law. So it's basically illegal to disturb the birds. And then we also have the phasing out of DDT. So in the early eight, uh, 1980s, so it was kind of phasing out a bit in the late 1970s, but it had completely stopped in about 1982, which also did quite a lot of good. It's also hard not to ignore the, the collaboration between the different charities and conservation char charities throughout here in the UK. So most of these issues are also, of course, like felt all, all around the board really. So it's collaborative working really important to sort of share ideas of what, what has and hasn't worked, that kind of thing. And this is just a few examples of what's been done here in Lincolnshire. So this is the Anderby Marsh, so just south of Anderby Creek Village. So this was purchased in 2009 by Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust. And uh, from, from then it was converted into a wetland site. So you can see it's really nice. So basically uh, when it was purchased, uh, they um, we basically got rid of all the field drains in the field. So basically block up the water, so stop the water draining out of the field, basically back it up. And as a result, uh, then we had quite a big wetland site. And then in 2021, uh, we raised up the sluice gate. So in previous years, the sluice gate was, was much lower than it was, so about a metre lower in the field than it used to be. And then in 2021, we got some really good funding through the Environment Agency to raise up the sluice gate. And now we've basically increased the water table and the water level on the marsh into what we have here today. And also for evidence uh, to, to show uh, the, the development in the marsh, we also have these, these numbers of birds. So from this is comparing the three years in January, from 2020, 2021, and then in late 2021, we did the work on the sluice gate to raise up the water level. And you see now the massive difference in, in species and numbers of birds as well on the marsh. So from before the sluice gate work, 265 birds at the peak count. Uh, and then in 2022, this is the shores of 4,000 birds on the marsh. This is really good as a food source for the marsh harries. So marsh harries typically feed on sort of small uh, voles, uh, mammals, that kind of thing. But also it takes small birds. And water birds is quite a good, good part of their diet as well. So water birds like moor hens and coots are quite well favoured. They also go up to sort of bigger species such as pheasants and rabbits as well. And just for information on the bottom right here, uh, this, the color scheme here is yellow, yellow and red. So the yellow indicates um, amber listed species. So these are the birds under conservation concern. So this, the amber listed species are species that have declined by uh, 25 to 50 percent in the UK over the last 30 years. And then the red listed is species that have declined in the UK between 50 and 75 percent over the last 30 years. So as you can see, we're getting quite a nice increase in lapwings as well. It's really good and kill you as well. And then other sites, we have the, the Willow Tree Fen Reserve. So it's been a complete success. So uh, John Oliver's done a fantastic job on this reserve over the last few years. So you obviously probably know about the, the cranes that bred here during lockdown. So 2020, first breeding record in Lincolnshire for 400 years. Also for marsh harriers. So up to eight pairs of marsh harriers now breeding on site, which is quite a phenomenal number. And during the year the cranes nested, uh, they, we did decide to take out the central track on the reserve, which really did help sort of safeguard the species and give them much more space to spread out. And wildlife's really thrived in this area in the last couple of years. 
So recent roosting counts on the reserve have included up to 30 marsh harriers in the winter months. So going back to that one pair in 1971, we now have up to 30 birds wintering in this area. It's absolutely quite phenomenal, as well as eight breeding pairs. In addition to this, uh, hen harriers as well, to two, uh, two ringtail hen harriers recently, good numbers of swans, up to 150 hooper swans, and a few Buick swans as well. Also bitterns back on site. It's a, so suspected breeding in 2023 was the first breeding for bitterns on this site. So quite a success all round. We also have the nature reserve at Farings. So on the pitch, pictures on the left and the middle here, just shows the before and after uh, of the reed bed management. So reed bed, so quite important to keep open the reed beds for nesting bitterns and marsh harries. So marsh harries often need access to the open water to find their food, as well as in the reed bed itself. So it just shows, uh, so from night, when this when this reed bed was cut, it then shows just that after five years how quickly the reed's closing. So all these nice little water features previously here, obviously all gone now as the reed's come in. And also on the top right here, we have the uh, these are called truck saw machines. So this is an amphibious machine with a big big cutting head, which basically clears out the reed the reed drains or the drains within the reed system. So really important job to keep the reeds in check because it will take over eventually. And then on the bottom right, this was a recent picture shown uh, after lots of funding from the Environment Agency again. So open the, open the reed beds and the water levels, water features. And now on the uh, far rings, so up to three to four pairs of booming bitterns in recent years, uh, two to three pairs of marsh harriers. So it's again, been quite a success. So a big shout out to Simon Wellick for doing this work. And it's also hard to ignore the, the amount of time and effort our volunteers put into our reserves every year. So without our volunteers, we really wouldn't be able to do what we do day to day. So very important that we maintain the reed beds. So uh, do like a regular rotation of cutting the reeds because they do become quite thatchy after a while. It's very important to encourage that new growth on a rotation. Also things like removing willow trees because willow trees can very quickly take over reed beds and dry out the reeds in the water. Also on the bottom left here, we have the, the Crane Watch volunteers. A big shout out to you guys. So it's a very important aspect to our job is to show visitors uh, like the wildlife that we have on reserves. It's so very important. Also to share the knowledge that we have, just to educate people as well. It's a really important part of our job. So after all this management work on our reserves, uh, how, how are things looking now for marsh harriers? So in the UK now, uh, up to 590 breed pairs of marsh harriers. So in 2023, we did a quick roundup of marsh harriers on our LWT reserves. So 23 nesting marsh harriers on Lynx Trust reserves. They managed to fledge 35 chicks, which is quite phenomenal. So we then calculate this 23 pairs divided by the UK pairs to work out the percentage. So we now have 4% of the UK population of marsh harriers nesting on Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust nature reserves. I think we could, we could be quite proud of that, I think. And then just to give an indication of wintering numbers in Lincolnshire. So this is Lincolnshire as a whole, so as opposed to just LWT reserves. So approximately 100 to 150 wintering birds throughout Lincolnshire, which is quite incredible. Again, going back to that 1971, one breeding pair in the whole of the UK. So now having up to 150 just in Lincolnshire alone in the winter months, which is quite staggering. And then these were some quite recent figures produced by the BTO. So showing the vintage change in their range in the breeding season. So from 1968 to 1972. So it was just that one pair in 1971 and then a few pairs before that. So then compare that to 2008 and 2011. We now have uh, an increase of 884%, which is quite incredible. And also looking at the wintering figures as well as the breeding figures. So the change in the range in the winter from 1981 to 84 to 2007 and to 2011. So we now have uh, plus 500% more marsh harries in the winter months than we had in 1981 and 1984. So, so all around a massive conservation success really from that one pair in 1971. So now having 600 pairs in the UK, so quite impressive. 
So what's next? What else can we do? We've got these fantastic results for Marsh Harrows from the last few years. There's, all, there's always new things that can be done. So for example, linking up land. So here at Lincolnshire Coastal Country Park, so you'll see we, LWT own quite a few sites just south and north of Vanderby Creek. So possibilities in the future could be linking up all these reserves, making some nice connectivity between Chapel and Sutton-on-Sea for all these species. We're also developing land inland nature reserves from the coastal, uh, from the um, Hudson Bank Road, main coast road, as well. And also uh, Woodall Spa Airfield. So just to show, just to show what has been done here over the previous few years. So creating quite big wetlands and reed beds as well, and then seeing how the site develops in the future. So also quite new acquisitions. So this is a um, uh, new new fen, newborn fen, just new willow tree fen. So a recent site purchased by Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust in recent years. So it'd be great to link up some of these sites with say willow tree fen, and also a bit further down at Baston fen. We're just looking at the success that willow tree has, has produced over the last few years. Imagine imagine this quite basically upscaled. Be some quite fantastic results there could be. We also think about the climate as well. So going forward with these these designs and nature reserves, we've also got a look at the future. So based on sort of climate predictions, so sea level rise. Uh, so where can we make wetlands that are safer from uh, sea level rise? So close, so further inland, so sites like Willow Tree Fen, a bit more safeguarded than the coastal sites, which are quite low lying. So the top picture here shows Gibraltar Point. This is in the 2013 tidal surge. Just to give you some bearings, uh, this is the Fenland Lagoon just here, and the West Hyde just here, and then the Bulldog Bank, which was breached in about six places during the tidal surge. So where the photograph was taken was the West Dunes, so looking across, and then you've got the, the Mere Hyde over here, freshwater marsh, Mill Hill, and big meadow outside the Mere, so the Mere Meadow just here. We've also got to think about the weather as well in recent years. So droughts have been quite a big issue the last couple of years, especially, whereas the winter months are becoming much more milder than they used to be. The summers are becoming much drier, and the spring's becoming much wetter as well. So how we go about managing the water levels has been quite tricky in recent years. So for example, you have a nice, nice wet marsh in the, in the spring, you want to let some water off for your breeding waders and nesting birds. And then you could get a very hot summer. The whole marsh could be dry up within two weeks or two months. Also from a carbon storage point of view as well. So there is evidence to suggest that, that wetlands store 10 times the amount of carbon than woodlands. And then just to finish off by saying, obviously this talk is focused on marsh harries. We just have massive benefits to other species as well. So all the species pictured here are increasing in the UK in recent years. So we've got the water ball on the top left, the otter on the top right, uh, avocets, again, just like marsh harries, quite a big success story in conservation. Uh, the willow emerald damselfly, which is spreading northwards due to climate change. They're becoming much more common now on reserves. And then also perhaps one day we might have swallowtails nesting breeding in the county. So nice little, little prediction there, possibly. Thank you for listening. <laughs>